Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and welcome to another Talent Agenda Series webinar. Um, following on from some great sessions that we had in 2017, this is the first one of the year in 2018, and we're joined by some very special guest presenters um, from Willis Towers Watson, uh, who've uh, anybody who's been to the Talent Agenda Series events um, in Johannesburg and, and Nairobi will have heard these presenters before who've delivered some really exciting insight and some great content at conferences that we've had across the continent. So today we're being joined by Matthew McDonnell, uh, Crispin Marriott and Mirav Shah from the from the Employee Engagement and, and Insights team who will be presenting some uh, data, some brand new data um, about engagement levels across African markets as well as some uh, cutting edge technology to allow you to access uh, these insights and, and, and get the views of people in your organization um, as well. So in addition to being part of the uh, the surveys that they, they're going to show you today, they're, they're Africa's biggest provider of surveys by volume, uh, employee engagement surveys that is, and they're also part of the Careers in Africa Employer of Choice Initiative, which provides the um, the talent pool view to go alongside the engagement view from your own organization so you can kind of create a 360 view of how your employer brand is perceived and how your employees are engaged and more than engaged I think I think my spiel about engagement is about to be dated by their latest high-tech um, reveal so this webinar really focuses on the future of engagement and how that future for the highest performing companies is already here while the rest of us kind of play play catch-up uh, the best have identified new ways to understand, empower, and engage their people, and to fundamentally change the relationships between uh, people and the organizations they work for or work with or uh, drive. Um, so throughout this presentation, you can submit questions to Crispin, Matthew, and Mirav via the webinar platform. Just type your question in, and it will come through to the moderators here at GCC, who will check it to make sure it's uh, legit and then forward it for them to answer at certain points in the presentation. Uh, let's keep it really interactive, please. Don't withhold your questions, get them across, and uh, we can make it part of the discussion. And if you stick around till the end of the webinar, which we really hope you will, um, you'll get some of the most interesting data right at the end, and also a couple of compelling offers for how you might be able to get Willis Towers Watson's uh, solutions into your plans for 2018 and beyond. Okay, enough from me. Uh, let's get the show on the road. The Talent Agenda Series now presents this session on employee engagement and pulse technology led by Matthew, Crispin, and Mirav of Willis Towers Watson. And thank you all for joining us. Okay, thank you, uh, Alex. This is Crispin Marriott. Uh, welcome everyone to the uh, webinar. Um, Alex was just talking about the future of employee engagement. So I'm just gonna kick off briefly um, with the history of employee engagement and talk a little bit about how we've got to where we are today in the industry, how organizations are using engagement and where we see this uh, going in the future and where our clients are going in the future in the employee engagement space. So going way back to uh, when I started out in this industry, um, the study that started it all was quite a famous one, um, published in Harvard Business Review, which back in the 1990s was looking at the relationship between employee satisfaction and various outcomes um, off the back of that. And that's what became known as the service profit chain, so satisfied employees tended to stick around longer, better levels of employee retention for organizations, and tended to be more productive. And employees that are more productive and stick around longer add value to the organization through the service profit chain. Uh, you get more satisfied customers, more loyal customers, and you do better financially in terms of growing your revenues and profitability. Um, it all started here, and this kind of service profit chain type uh, approach is still very prevalent today. Um, only nowadays we use engagement to predict all sorts of organizational outcomes, from profitability in sales to safety outcomes to the likelihood of a company suffering a catastrophic cyber breach, through to HR metrics, turnover, sickness, days away from work, all those sorts of things. Um, and back then in the 90s, people were talking about employee satisfaction, which was really saying, am I happy working here? Do I like my job? Do I like the company? And that did, as we saw in the previous slide, have some impact on organizational performance. But I can be very satisfied and happy at an organization, but not do very much. I can sit around, surf the internet, look out the window, be happy with my paycheck, but not really deliver performance. 
So people started to talk more um, around about commitment in the late uh, 1990s. It was, you know, am I committed to this organization? Will I stay? And then they talked much more about engagement. So this notion of uh, an emotional connection to the organization. And, and engaged employees typically do three things. They think, they feel, and they act. So you know, do they like it here at the organization? Do they buy into what the organization is about? Um, so for example, if I'm very anti-smoking, I'm not gonna have a great career uh, working for Japan Tobacco International. Um, the emotional thing um, is around, do you like it? Would you recommend it to colleagues, to friends? Do you wear the company t-shirt under your pajamas when you go to bed at night? And finally, the act component is the bit that really differentiates engagement from satisfaction. So once I'm at work, um, do I actually deliver extra discretionary effort? Do I go the extra mile? Am I intending to stay here, build my career here, and deliver for the organization whilst I work at the organization? And so for many years, this type of model of engagement was used. It's a significantly better predictor of organizational performance than employee satisfaction. But we also found that companies starting to ask the questions that we see on this on this slide. So, you know, engagement might be pretty good, but how do we actually get more out of our people without burning them out? Um, in terms of survey process, how do we move from survey data and insights to action that really drives change? How do we get engagement to be owned by the business and business leaders rather than it being seen as just another HR initiative or the survey as being something that's done by HR to people in the organization? And finally, increasingly, the key issue is the extent to which company culture, as measured in a survey, is actually aligned with and supports the execution of strategy and strategic business priorities. So, for example, the type of culture that would best predict success in a fast-growing tech startup is probably very different from that you might see in a large-scale power utility or transportation type firm. So, Beyond engagement, we started to see over the last five or six years, people talking more about what Willis Towers Watson we call sustainable engagement, which is the think, feel, and act component, but also saying, in addition to thinking, feeling, and acting, am I also enabled and energized at work? So enablement is around about the work environment supporting me to deliver that engagement. So if you think about engagement as being as an engine on the car, Enablement is the gearbox that allows the power to get to the wheels. So can I deliver my engaged workforce style or do I have things that get in the way, like uh, supervisors that are incompetent, bad IT systems, whatever it might be. And the final component, which is increasingly more important in organizations globally, is the notion of emotional and psychological well-being at work. We want people to be engaged. We don't want them to be engaged and burnt out. We want them to be performing um, as best that they can. So sustainable engagement is a much more common metric now that looks at the think, feel, and act, brings in the notion of enablement, and also the notion of psychological and emotional well-being or energy at work. And there's a reason why we're more interested in sustainable engagement, because organizations with sustainable engagement tend to have much better levels of performance. So we see that on this chart, you can see where you have higher levels of sustainable engagement, you're getting better performance on different metrics. Also, the combined measure of sustainable engagement is about three times stronger as a predictor of performance than just the traditional think, feel, and act component metric of engagement. So we know engagement matters. We work with thousands of companies around the world measuring engagement and linking engagement scores to business outcomes. As I said, whether or not that's safety incidents, employee turnover, customer satisfaction, sales growth, mining productivity, whatever it might be, it's a very strong business measure. So given that little history lesson, um, I think you know, sort of how we got to where we got to, and bearing in mind that most organizations now are thinking about engagement as a performance metric for the business, much more so than an HR metric for um, HR departments, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Matt McDonald, who's going to talk a little bit about <coughs> engagement, culture, and employee experience. Over to you, Matt. Okay. Thanks very much, Crispin. Uh, Matthew McDonald here speaking. 
Um, so in engagement and sustainable engagement, as Crispin just defined it, um, is what we call in research an outcome variable. So you can't actually work directly on engagement itself. It's more a state of mind of employees or a frame of mind, how they feel about work and, and their willingness to put in the extra mile. Um, but so what we do in our research is we look at the other elements which might be driving engagement. So we're looking at leadership behaviors, management behaviors, the culture and the shared beliefs and behaviors within the organization, which are most likely to drive an engaged culture. Um, and that's what organizations ask us to do. Um, so, so sometimes people, you'll hear people saying, well, just give me my engagement measure, or we're just gonna track engagement. Um, but in our view, that's not enough. You've really got to look at what will be driving engagement. What are the things that you can materially impact to drive engagement levels even higher in your organization. So um, we have about 700 active clients in our database um, each year. Um, and what we're able to do is look across all these organizations um, by sector, uh, identify clients which are outperforming their peers, both financially and in terms of engagement scores. Um, and we've developed a blueprint of what we call a high performance culture. In other words, organizations that try to create this culture are much more likely to drive engagement levels, which as Crispin said, will drive business performance. And here's the uh, results of that analysis. Um, and, and what's quite interesting, um, if you look towards the bottom of the graph here, we're looking at how do these high performing companies, the ones we've selected, how do they compare to the average? Um, and the, the, the areas in green here, supervision, work tools and conditions, work life, workload balance, efficiency, pay and rewards, don't really differentiate high performance. Most organizations, most multinationals or regional organizations do a pretty good job of this. Um, in, in other words, the more you, unless you've, you haven't reached the, the, the baseline of, of, of adequate performance here, it's not gonna really make a huge difference. Um, where we do see high-performing organizations beginning to pull away from the pack, um, it's the degree to which they empower people, empower people to make decisions, to, to innovate, um, and they delegate the decisions to the right level of the organization. They align people around the goals and objectives. Um, they have um, state-of-the-art performance evaluation and performance management uh, programs, and they have a very collaborative working environment. So they're beginning to pull away. And the top um, five themes here are the ones that really differentiate high performers. Um, so it's around the way they lead, and I'll talk to, to you in a moment about that. It's about the image of the organization. Um, it's around how they communicate, career development, and customer focus. So these are the five elements that will most likely drive your engagement levels um, and create a high performance culture. And what we've done here on this slide is to try to summarize what that high performance culture would look like. Um, so the first thing that leaders do, they align people around a purpose. Um, and many of you will be dealing with millennials, um, obviously in Africa, there's a very young workforce. Uh, we know that their needs are different and they want to work for an organization that has a strong mission, has a purpose um, and serves a broader purpose within um, uh, the society and environment at large. Um, so getting people to buy into this strategy um, and how it supports um, those, those beliefs is absolutely critical. Um, they also take huge pride in the products and services and they make sure employees really believe that the brand or the organization they're working for is one of the best in the marketplace. Um, and they remain agility, they remain agile and innovative um, in all their processes and the way they respond to the market. Um, so the, these are very adaptive organizations. They, they accept that change is um, uh, part of the course, that all organizations are going through change all the time, and so they develop a real uh, versatility and a resilience in their employees to, to adapting to change. They create a great deal for their employees. So they um, develop people, they have a very clear career path so people can visualize where they're gonna be with the, with the, in, within the organization over the, the long term as well as the short term. And finally, they create a, a culture which, which has a real element of trust. So people are respected, um, there's fair treatment for all, um, it's an inclusive environment, um, they're inspired to give their best and they have a strong belief in what the organization says, what the leadership says, says and they believe that leaders are true to their words or so whatever leaders are saying they will act um, in accordance with with these statements 
So those are the elements that really define a high performance organization and the elements, if you focus on these, um, you'll drive engagement levels more than in any other areas um, within the organizational experience. So we've talked about engagement, sustainable engagement and building high performance culture. Um, what we want to do to, um, before we show our live demo is to talk about how organizations are driving and tracking um, employee engagement and the, and the employee experience. So the biggest change we've seen in the last couple of years is it's moved away from simply a one-off annual engagement survey event, which is where a lot of organizations started off with um, five, five to 10 years ago. Um, and they're looking at measuring the whole employee experience, just as you would measure customer experience. So uh, customer scientists will look at um, the experience of potential customers before they um, purchase uh, to understand the psychology of their, their, their buyers. Likewise, organizations need to understand what do people think of the brand um, or the employer that they're likely to join before they've even joined. Um, so they're measuring metrics such as websites, um, how often websites are visited, Glassdoor um, ratings, etc. They measure how they're successful their recruitment process is, so that's time to hire and feedback on the assessment process. So are we getting the right candidates in when we assess them? Are we turning a lot away or are we getting some uh, good hits in terms of who's coming through to the organization? And there's a variety of surveys throughout the life cycle. So that's new joiner surveys, um, assessment of the high performers, so they're tracking their high performance cadre, um, how they feel about the organization, tracking them over the years, um, performance of new joiners, tracking engagement, but also ways of tracking um, develop aspects of development, so 360 feedback, um, leadership, um, feedback on learning and development programs, and finally exit surveys and regrettable losses. So building a picture of the full employee experience and understanding, you know, in terms of these touch points, what are the significant interventions they need to make to align the organization to a, to a high performance culture. And so looking through the survey strategies um, that, that organizations are now beginning to employ, um, most of them are still doing an annual survey, a one-off survey event, um, but what we're seeing is the trend is moving away from every year or every two years um, to, to supplementing that with pulse surveys. Um, and in some cases, this replaces the annual survey. Sometimes they keep the annual survey going. Um, uh, we still believe that as a fundamental cornerstone that there isn't anything better than an annual engagement survey allows you to understand and how to tackle change from the leadership level all the way down to local management um, and also to um, look at linkage research to see what's driving um, uh, engagement to different parts of the business. But they're supplementing it with agile pulse surveys, um, lifestyle check-ins and the fourth one, active listening, which we'll touch on in a minute. Um, which is around um, social jams and digging deeper into particular issues online uh, with, with the community of uh, respondents. So that's the big trends we're seeing in the market in terms of how your people are building their listening strategy. And I'd like to take a few questions now before we go on to a live demo of the tool um, to show you exactly how organizations are doing that now. So Alex, um, well, sure. hopefully you can open the line to some, some questions. Yeah, absolutely. So we're, we're taking questions all the way through the presentation. And whenever you think uh, that you've got something you'd like to find out about, please just uh, type it into the panel um, and it will come through to the team. I always find there's nothing like a Willis Towers Watson presentation for understanding uh, where you're not quite doing enough in your organization. So I assume quite a few of you like me have seen the, uh, the slides around creating high performance cultures and are a little bit shell shocked thinking about all the things that you need to do to close the gap. Um, so that might be why uh, there's a little bit of silence on the questions so far. So if there are any questions as we, as we as we go along, please please send them in. I think probably the one question so far that stands out is, um, I'm not sure who's the best place to answer this, but since I know that um, we had, the, the, the culture of sort of post survey is relatively recent. Um, how, how how about survey fatigue and stuff like that? Is that still a concern, or is that is that concern changing, or how does that um, how does survey fatigue impact on uh, on on doing the, uh, the the survey in the way that you've described for best practice? Yeah, 
Um, it's, it's, a, it's a legitimate concern, and I think um, particularly with sort of pulse and DIY technologies, um, there, there is the risk that an organisation could saturate um, their, their employees with surveys um, and using surveys rather than just having meaningful dialogue through team meetings, etc. with people. Um, so we, we do suggest uh, that you have a governance and a process around creating a listening strategy, which, which would be based around a one-off annual event um, and probably no more than sort of quarterly pulse check-ins on key issues that you're tracking because normally you can't impact anything within your org at an organization wide level um, it takes at least four months to three, three to four months to really see any impact um, so if you're surveying more than that you're probably over surveying your populations yeah and I would just add that to say obviously it's slightly dependent on the number of people you have in your company if for example you've got 10,000 people it's quite easy to rotate a sample around so that individual people are not getting you know, 10 surveys a year, but you're, you're taking different sample cohorts um, and targeting that very carefully. So for example, you may be sending out a, a survey to new joiners um, who have not yet actually had the opportunity to put out the broader engagement survey because they've been there for less than 12 months. So there are some ways around it, but I, I think Alex, you're right, it's a very common concern and we've certainly seen a lot of organizations try and get into this sort of rhythm of doing monthly surveys um, and actually abandoning that quite quickly just because it's too much and it is turning people off in the organization. Okay, thank you. We've had a couple of follow-up questions around, around that so I think that's answered the question for everybody who asked uh, exactly sort of how often we should be doing the surveys. Uh, there's a couple of follow-up questions around how long the, the non-annual and pulse type surveys are. Um, so what kind of duration they have and, and how you will go about setting those up. I guess that might be touched on in the demo, but if you've, have you got any anything to just note on that whilst it's been asked? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, I think, um, yeah, it, there's a wide amount of variability across organizations depending how sophisticated they are doing surveys, how often they've done surveys in the past. But the general trend is towards shorter surveys. Um, and, you know, typically for a what you might call broad-based engagement survey, we're probably looking at something in the region of between 35 and 55 questions nowadays, uh, which is, you know, most people can get through into 10 minutes or so. And for pulse-type questionnaires, that can often be quite a bit shorter, you know, 10, 12, 15, 20 questions. So it does vary a lot from organization to organization, um, but the move is pretty much towards shorter surveys. That said, I do have a global banking client whose annual engagement survey has still got about 145 questions in, but they are quite rare now. <laughs> Yeah, th there is a logic to it, which is um, when we do factor analysis on all the types of opinion questions you can ask, we normally get about 10 to 15 factors or themes. By that, I mean leadership, management, working relationships. So if that's the number of themes that sort of exist, um, you need about two or three questions to tap into each of those reliably. So you end up with a total of you know, 35 to 50 questions to get a broad brush feel for your organization across all the organizational experience of employees. Okay, the questions have started to sort of flood in now, so we're going to have to curate a little bit. And, and so any other questions around the kind of construction of, of pulse surveys, I'm going to push those into the next question break because I think the demonstration will help. Uh, but we'll certainly come back to those, anybody that asked that kind of question. Um, we have a question uh, asking, do you have an example um, of linking employee engagement with um, clear performance in business measures? So just in case there's anybody anybody else asking that question, I think there was something on it, but um, guys, have you got anything you'd like to just point out around that? Um, yes, we do that many, many times for many, many clients, and the outcome variables, business variables we measure against are very varied depending on clients. Um, but for example, business type metrics might be customer satisfaction in a retail department store. It might be sales growth in a retail unit or bank branch. So for example, in the UK banking industry, typically a 4% increase in employee engagement at the branch level is associated with a 10% increase in sales volume versus target at the branch level. For um, some of the big um, Pan-African mining companies, we look at things like productivity, tonnage hauled out of a mine um, in big trucks per shift, link that back to engagement. 
He's even done it in restaurants, looking at the link between engagement and the amount of alcohol you should put in a cocktail. Um, so it's really, really variable. But usually we start with organizations and we say, well, what are the key performance metrics that you track in your business? And then from that, we then say, now let's look at which elements of the employee experience are predictive of those business outcomes. So um, really, whatever you track in an organization is a key performance indicator, either in the HR space or hard business numbers. Um, theoretically, at least, we can do a linkage study against uh, cultural components against that. And what some organizations are doing now, which the software allows you to do, is actually show engagement scorecard and business performance scorecard. So you can see the numbers lined up next to each other. So you can see well, engagement's dropping in this part of the business and their performance metrics are dropping. Um, so they're using it as an integrated tool, looking at business metrics and engagement metrics together. Okay. I think there's a question here from Vanessa that sort of leads leads on from that. So how would you... How would you practically implement um, on the thriving aspect of the employee experience? So just getting into how we can uh, how we can use the stuff to really drive some change as well as to align it to our business processes. And I think around the thriving part of the the employee experience, particularly. Interesting. Yeah. So, so the question is around what are organisations doing around thriving? Um, you know, in high performance organisations. Um, and yeah, as we talked about before, it's all about um, uh, you know approach to change management and accepting change is absolutely continuous. Um, they're, they're developing a lot of agility, agility scrums. So so decisions are being made in a very different way and very less hierarchical than they had in the past. So that's one of the biggest changes we're seeing. So de delegation, cross-functional teams. Um, and building resilience in employees to, to, to make organizations very rapid in, in the way they can respond to um, uh, market uh, requirements. Yeah, and I think there's one other element of that, which is a more fundamental notion of what I would call business literacy amongst employees, so that all people in any organization, no matter how big or small, really understand how that organization ultimately makes money and delivers its purpose and its strategy, and really understands their role in achieving that. And once that line of sight becomes very clear, then people have a sense that if they uh, are engaged and they thrive personally, then the business will thrive personally. So it's actually drawing much closer links between the individual personal experience and the business experience of the organization as a whole. Okay. And uh, just one last question on this stage before we move on. If you've submitted a question we haven't asked it yet, don't worry, there are another couple of question breaks and we'll we'll get around all the questions. But the one last one, I think, before we move on is um, uh, there was a reference in there to, to millennials and some of the changes in the way engagement's measured um, being to, to deal with the millennial experience. Have you seen any, any trends upcoming or any solutions changing uh, to deal with Generation Z, um, Generation Z and what they... Uh, what they will want that's different to the uh, millennials. There's people in our office pointing at themselves and saying, that's me, what are you going to do for me? Um, so there's obviously some real interest in Generation Z. Uh, have you got any sense of what's coming for, for engagement based on, on the next generation after the millennials? Yeah, I mean, I think if you look at um, different age brackets or career brackets, whatever, however you want to define it for different populations, <coughs> you do see differences. I think there are a number of things just in the interest of time now, you can characterize you know, younger sort of generations, millennials, gen Generation Z, et cetera, as wanting. I think the first thing they want is much better, faster communication. They want to feel more involved. You know, um, in the interconnected world, if I want to find something out, I can pretty much get it off a device within minutes. So how reasonable is it that when I want to find out something in an organization, it might take me two weeks and there's various compliances and people not allowed to know things. So a very different componentry around what people expect in terms of communication, very different in terms of what they expect in terms of career growth, development opportunities, and um, how fast those are made available. Very different expectations there. And also, I think, um, much more of a concern about the organization's sort of corporate social responsibility profile. Things like the image, what you're doing for people, community, environment, becoming much, much more important to younger generations. And allied to that is this kind of notion of a sense of purpose, that the, I buy into the organization's purpose and that my personal values and sense of purpose to achieve things 
beyond just making money for the organization are much more important. So we do see some quite big generational shifts um, in terms of the things that really make people more or less engaged depending by where they are in the organization. Okay, Alex, shall we move on to the demo? I think we absolutely should. And if anybody submitted a question, we'll, we'll come back to it later on. And thank you for those questions so far. Do keep them coming. Okay, so I'll pass over now to my colleague, Mirav Shah, who's going to uh, take you through a demo so you can see kind of how companies are using these technologies to design and deliver and act on surveys. Perfect. Thanks, Kristen. So I'm just going to spend a few minutes um, going through the software. And as Matt and Crispin have been talking, a lot of that intellectual capital that they've been talking about has actually been built into the survey platform. Um, so the idea is once you have access to this platform, you're able to use a lot of that intellectual capital to go out and really understand what your employees are saying. Very simple uh, software. It's end-to-end -end solution, so you can design your survey in here, build a survey here, and also all the reporting is done in this one single survey platform. So the first part, I'm just going to start off with creating and building a survey and just showing you quickly um, the steps that are involved and some of the functionality that is available through this particular platform. So the first step is just to create or edit a survey. And there's two different ways we can build these surveys. One is using your HRIS information. So that's your internal database that you might already have that lets you have all that information about where an employee sits in the organization, if you're a multinational, which countries they are in. And you're able to pre-code all that information using your pre-populated database so that the employees then just respond to the opinion questions um, and when you come to the analysis, you've got quite accurate information that allows you to segment your data and really understand what the population is saying. However, if you don't have that database, um, we can also have an open uh, survey. So this is one in which the employees or the respondents select where in the organization they sit, how long they've been at the organization, and any other demographics or um, segmentation information you want to be able to split the data by. So what I'm going to demo today is the pre-coding or the HRIS one, um, just to give you a flavor of how that works in practice. So the first thing that we do is we just have a survey name. Um, I'm going to use Matt's name and call it uh, Matthew Test here. So each participant gets their own link. So this is the pre-coding or the HRIS style survey where we'll pre-code the uh, demographic information for employees. I'll just add probably um, people often ask about anonymity, confidentiality. Um, it is a question um, and you know, if we are pre-coding, it does mean that we know where people sit but the, the system doesn't allow you as the organization to see um, group uh, individual data. So you'll only ever see groups of data and we reassure uh, respondents of that um, when they complete the survey so that no individuals can be identified through this survey process. Exactly. Um, and you always do have the ability to use the open survey, so that's where all participants get the same link. And so there is both the options available directly through the software. So I've just created um, the survey and within a second we'll see the actual survey designer interface. And this is where we will be spending some time um, being able to design the survey. The great thing about the software is you can design and deploy a survey within a few minutes. So um, if you have the questions in mind, you, you know what you want to ask, you can actually create that survey almost instantly and send it out to all the participants that you want to uh, within a few minutes and it's out to the market um, or out to your employees to complete. So the first step is to select the survey participants. Um, and to do this, what we would need from you is a HRIS file or a pre-coding file that provides us with who you want to be able to take surveys um, within your organization, and as well as any demographic coding information that you have. So this could be where they sit in the organization, how long they've been there, what their age is, if you have that information available. Once you provide that to us, we will load it into the system so you have that available and you can then select the survey participants that you want to add. The great thing with this is there's a number of ways to select survey participants. And to that first question about survey fatigue, there is the ability to add random samples, 
select subsets of this population using demographic views. So you're not over surveying the same uh, population with lots and lots of different surveys. You can really segment the population that you want to ask specific questions to. We have the ability to select everyone. So that's just um, selecting everyone. You can click on this box and everyone will get selected. You can also apply filters. So if there are specific criteria that you want to look out for, maybe it's a certain part of the organization that you want this particular survey to go to, maybe a specific age range or generation. So if we're looking at millennials specifically and we want to better understand them, we can filter on that and be able to identify that particular population to survey. So for now, I'm just going to select a few people um, and quite simply, you just add them and this is the population that will now receive the survey. The next bit is choosing the demographic questions. So these are the questions that you want to segment your data by. And we have four different ways of doing this. One is from the HRIS file. So this is the, the file that I was mentioning before where you would provide us with the information. If you want to ask any questions where the respondent self-selects, we can do that um, either from a library past survey or adding in custom questions. So I'm going to do one from the demographics. I'm going to choose the hierarchy and country option. So we'll be able to segment the data by your organizational structure, as well as the country um, employees sit in. And then I'll choose another one that we have from the library. So this might be how old you are um, and what function you work in. So this is something that employees can select themselves. And the idea of the tool is to give you that flexibility. If you have specific questions that um, you might not want uh, to pre-code or are sensitive, you can let employees choose whether they want to respond to those questions. Then I'm going to move on to the opinion question. So this is the, the bulk of the survey often. This is where you'll get the responses. And we have a number of ways of selecting which opinion questions as well. One of the great features of this tool is we already have pre-populated survey templates. So this allows you to use some of that intellectual capital that Matthew and uh, Crispin were talking about earlier and using our research to identify questions that fit best together on different topics. So we've got a pre um, set engagement survey for you. Uh, we've got different surveys. If you're going through a, a change program within your organization, you can use the change readiness, cultural assessment. If you're going through M&A, if you want to understand the benefits and rewards within your organization, or you want to get ahead of the cyber risk element, you can use the cyber risk culture. So you've got a number of different templates to select from, but you don't have to just use the questions and the templates. You can add or remove questions. Um, but we, we've done this for you. A lot of these templates are already benchmarked against our norms. And that's another feature that um, I really want to highlight in this tool. We've got about 400 different benchmarks across regions. So you'll have um, an Africa norm. You'll have additional norms, sort of more regional norms. You'll also have the country norms. But in addition to that, you get sector norms and you have our high performance norms. So this is our stretch benchmark that really lets you compare against organizations that have great financial performance, but also very good HR or cultural practices. For now, I'm just going to select the engagement um, survey so you can just get a sense of how simple it is to create an engagement survey. Here you can see the different themes that Matt was talking about earlier. So within each of these themes, there'll be um, a few questions to understand that theme better. And we can select all these questions um, to go into our survey. Of course, if you have any specific questions that you want to ask as an organization um, that might not be in our database that are tailored to you, we can do that through the Add Custom Questions option. So there's the ability to ask a completely customized question that's specific to your organization. And there's no limit on how many questions you ask here. One of the other features that we have available is free text comments. So if you want to ask open-ended um, questions around uh, what is a great, what are the great things about this organization. You can ask something like that and have a free text question that will be at the end of the survey where employees can respond to that specific question um, uh, and leave some comments, which we, you can then analyze in our reporting software. 
You can also see which questions have comparisons to the norms. So if you are looking at specific norms, you can uh, look through the norms. Um, I'll do South Africa for this one. We have a South African national norm, so you can choose that and be able to see the questions that are benchmarked. And in this case, from our templates, as you'll see, the majority of the questions are benchmarked against the South African norm. You can also see if any of these questions are from a past survey or pull in questions from a past survey. So you're basically able to duplicate a previous survey that you've run very quickly and very easily. The appearance um, column just lets you set up a team. It lets you have your logo and customize the appearance of your survey to be specific to your organization. And then we have the translations functionality where you're able to translate the survey into multiple languages. The software currently supports 70 to 80 different languages, um, and we have a really strong uh, database of languages that you can uh, select from and use translations or um, load in your own translations where they might not be available. And then, as simple as that, I've already created a survey. I can preview and publish my survey. So what I'm going to do now is if I click on the Create and Preview survey, you'll be able to see the survey interface. Um, that employees would be responding to. And uh, the software has been designed to be mobile first, so all the surveys that are designed on this particular software can be taken on tablets, can be taken on um, individuals' mobile phones. They resize and the, the, the software interface has been designed to work such that it's optimized on any mobile interface that you're using. So this is just a quick preview of the survey that you would have and um, really straightforward. So some of the questions that we have, the demographics, um, the HRIS questions are already populated in the database, so you don't see those, so those with the hierarchy um, and the country. But I asked two other questions, so age and which function do you work in, so you see those. And it's really straightforward. You just click on the, the response option that you want and it takes you to the next question. So you can go through a survey within five to 10 minutes, um, a survey of about 30 to 40 questions within five to 10 minutes on any device. Um, and it's, it's a really simple, straightforward experience for the user as well. So, um, that's the survey interface. I'm gonna jump into the next bit, which is the reporting um, and how all of this data that you capture translates into um, data that you can use to analyze and really understand uh, the employees within your organization. Yeah, just as Mirav just switches to the reporting platform. So one of the big leaps forward in terms of this software is its live data. Um, so we're, whatever you're viewing, even if it's after one week of the survey, the data you're seeing is the live responses um, for the opinion items um, uh, so you can see in real time how people are responding. So it does give you a very good indication of where the data may land by the end of the survey. So this is something that used to take um, weeks to, to get back from vendors. Um, but is now a live tool. So the CEO says, well, um, tell me, how's it looking so far? You can actually say, well, leadership scores are looking, um, you know, 70% favorable so far. So that's a big leap forward in terms of the immediacy and, and creating real sort of agility um, in terms of responding to these survey results. Thanks. So I've just jumped into the reporting platform. What you should be able to see now um, is the the data in its uh, within the reporting tool. So what we have here is the high level results for a manager. Um, it just tells you the response rates how many of the categories have improved or declined versus historical data, and how you compare it to the high performance data. So what you log into as a manager or as a user of our reporting interface will be a quick summary of how the data um, or how your particular part of the organization is performing um, across all these different cultural metrics. Of course, you can dig deeper into it. You can look at um, reports that sit underneath you in the organization. But I'm just going to start off with going through some of the, the key functionalities that are available within the software um, for reporting purposes. 
So the first thing that I'm going to show you here after the, the high level summary is the ability to identify key metrics that you want to compare against the benchmark. So sustainable engagement is often our key outcome variable. And you can see how that performs against historical data, against the overall company and against external benchmark data. One of the real strengths of this reporting platform is this particular algorithm here that you can see, which has the strengths and opportunities. And what this particular algorithm does is it sits in the background and mines through all the data and all the questions for you to help using certain identifiers for key drivers to predict the areas of strengths that are coming up for your particular organization, but also the areas of opportunities where you need to spend some more time. So this takes into account, again, a lot of our intellectual capital where we've identified certain key drivers. So we can run key drivers both on your data, but also certain key drivers for certain sectors that we know from our research. And you can um, optimize the algorithm to really help pull out or predict certain opportunity areas that will be important for your particular uh, part of the organization to work on. And that's something that's a real strength of this particular tool. It gives the managers at an instance, at a glance, what are the things that they're doing really well, but also um, what are the areas that they need to spend more time focusing on. So you can see a little star here. This is a particularly important question as it's a key driver question. This Key driver question helps uh, improve or is a driver of sustainable engagement. So improving on this particular question helps predict an improvement in performance um, in sustainable engagement and also on your business performance due to the link of sustainable engagement on performance um, of the business. And then at the bottom, you can see all the questions that you had in the survey categorized as a first step. Um, and also with the uh, items underneath to be able to uh, compare against the historicals, against the benchmarks, and against the data. The other bit that this software does really well, and I'll, I'll touch on this um, again in the action planning, but what it does within the summary page is allows you to look at follow-up um, uh, suggestions for follow-up on some of these opportunity areas. So if we're looking at something like my manager gives me regular feedback on performance, the tool automatically provides you um, suggested actions. So we've built into the tool uh, our library, a custom library of um, feedback actions related to some of the uh, opportunity areas or some of the questions that you can ask in the survey. And so what it does for a manager is it gives them a head start in the action planning. They're able to use this uh, to help formulate ideas to improve that particular area. And this is, again, all on the summary page, and then you can dig into this in a little bit more detail in the action planning module, which I'll show you in a moment. So that's the summary results at a glance. Of course, you can dig deeper into the data by going into the actual interactive reports. And in this particular view, you can change your benchmarks if you have uh, more than one benchmark available. You can also be able to break down your data uh, or segment your data by different um, demographic options that you might have available. You can look at top and bottom questions. So these are the questions that are performing or have the highest scores. Um, you can also compare them against specific benchmarks. If I want to see the questions are doing best against norms or worst against norms, I can do that through this particular view. Um, and it also shows you the key drivers of engagement for your particular part of the organization. Yeah, so I just add one thing there, and maybe you can show the PowerPoint export too. Um, so one good thing about this program is, uh, or this platform, is that you can really be quite variable about it. So one of my big uh, African mining clients, they put manager reports into the hands of each shift leader for different shifts. Basically, very simple, saying these are the top three issues that you've got, top three things that are good, and these are the things you need to work on on Monday morning, and this is how you go about working on them at one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum, you might have a super user who is doing all these deep dive, uh, different analytics in the, uh, in, the, in the platform. So think about it as a reporting process that really gives people what they want, depending what they want. And so it 
takes away from you as HR practitioners any need to design or develop reports because the, the functionality Mary is about to show you is that all of this stuff uh, exports into PowerPoint. So you can literally, with just one click, say, okay, here is my report presentation for my part of the business with my data, my actions, et cetera, in it. So Mira, let's comment on that, maybe, and then we'll move on. Exactly. So as what's been said, um, there's a slides functionality that lets you export the reports into PowerPoint. We already have a predefined suggested slide, so this includes the strengths and opportunities, suggested actions, all the questions and categories against the key benchmarks as well as key drivers. But you can add additional information to this particular report based on some of the views that you might see that might be interesting to you in the actual reporting interface. So you can build a slide back that's customized to you. But as Crispin was saying, if you want something to go straight to the managers, um, you have a suggested slide back that can be downloaded at the click of a button. So just clicking on download slides on the bottom right um, and you'll get a slide back with your results. In addition to that, there is the ability to upload um, resources for your organization. So if you wanted to include manager guides, best practice communication videos, you can have all those resources available in one place on one platform so managers get an end-to-end -end experience where they can go into the tool, look at a manager guide, look at videos on communications and move directly into that. And then, um, the next bit I wanted to show you, linked to the, the home page or the summary screen, is the action planning. So this is where we can now um, give managers the ability to, to really take their own um, journey in terms of action planning. So they're able to see directly within the tool any um, items that have come up as key opportunity areas, so those will already be pre-populated for them. But after analyzing their results, if they identify there's another area they want to spend a bit of time focusing on, they're able to add it to their action plan and use our action library to identify focus areas or suggestions on those focus areas to help them really improve in that specific area. As super users, you also have the opportunity to push actions within the organization. So if I wanted to add this particular action um, and I wanted to push it to other people within the organization, I can push it to any of my peers or anyone who's sitting beneath me in the organization. So that allows you to really use um, the action planning functionality to send out messages or to all the managers within your organization um, on how they should be focusing on specific topic areas. You can also, as a super user, use the plan analysis functionality, so be able to see which action areas are being uh, focused on. So I'm just going to go into the overall report to show you how that would exactly work. So here, as the leader of the organization, I can have a look at which areas are focusing on action planning. Um, and so I can see in corporate functions, 16% are in progress, 55% are suggested, 1% is complete. I can see the priority areas that my business is focusing on. And then the final bit that's also integrated into the tool is the analytics. And this allows you to really um, go through the comments, but it does the hard work for you. So it reads through all the comments that are left, and it can read comments in up to 40 languages. I think the current count is 42. Um, and what it does for you is it, it synthesizes these comments into areas which are being most frequently commented on. So here we get a word cloud, and it, it, at a high-level glance, it tells me management is being spoken about most frequently, and we can see 25% of comments are about management. They also quite frequent, 21%. And there's some sentiment analysis that's built into the software as well, where you can see comments that are, are more negatively sentimented will be a darker red color, while those that are more neutral will be um, orange. And depending on the type of question, if you have a positively phrased question, you can sometimes get um, positively sentimented comments, which will often be green or blue. The software then allows you to be able to segment this data. So if you wanted to look at specific demographics and understand comments, so again, going back to the example of millennials, seeing what they're really saying, you can use this particular tool to be able to um, 
read the comments about millennials, see which areas they're talking about most frequently. Um, and it does a lot of that hard work for you rather than you reading through thousands of comments um, to try and build a picture of the data. But that's a really quick whirlwind tour of the uh, software from the uh, capturing of data all the way through to the reporting of data. And I'm going to hand it back to Matthew who will uh, wrap up. Yeah. yeah, actually, Alex, you may want to yeah. um, just see, see if there are questions there. Yeah, Dip into my question drawer. There are many. Um, thank you for that demo. Um, I've got the first couple of questions are around a bit of a hot topic at the moment, which is GDPR. Um, there's a couple of questions around it. So just, just in terms of data protection and across different markets and things, have you got anything, uh, any kind of update around uh, GDPR and data protection and how um, how surveys are going to be affected by that? Sure. So that, that's something that's forefront um, of our minds at the moment. We've got legal teams working on that. Uh, GDPR comes into effect uh, beginning of May. And um, so we've got a lot of uh, steps being put into our contracts in terms of making sure the, the language is clear. Um, and one of the key things that will come out of GDPR is the opportunity for respondents to indicate whether they want to uh, participate or give that specific data. So what we're seeing in some of our surveys now is we're adding a, an option or an opt-out option uh, for um, participants to avoid giving sensitive information. So that's often things like ethnicity, um, sexual orientation. So there's an opt-out functionality there um, that we're building into our surveys. But broadly, um, there is a lot of work going on in the background. Um, it is often a legal sort of side of things, so we're building that into our contract. But from a survey perspective, there are certain steps that we're taking to make sure we're compliant with GDPR. Thank you very much. Um, so there's another couple of questions that we've got around. Um, if someone has been running uh, previous engagement surveys in a different platform, um, how far can they pull questions in, or, or do they have to use pre-selected survey questions? No, they can certainly pull in um, questions that they've been using in a different survey platform. So um, we have a, a transition process, which is quite straightforward. They would just provide us with the questions they've been using in the past. We can load them into our system, and they'll have that available to select um, as questions within the software. And also, just to comment on that, too, I mean, you, you mentioned in your question about the, the survey modules are in here. Of course, if you choose any of those survey modules, there's nothing stopping you from editing them. So you can either add questions that you write yourself or other questions from the more extended um, item libraries, or you can remove questions from those certain modules. So um, there's an ultimate degree of flexibility there. Okay, thank you. Um, just last couple of questions on this then. Uh, we have a question about ENPS. Um, how do you link that with, with engagement scores and how could you use the, the tool to to, to position EMPS alongside uh, what we've seen today? Yeah, well, I mean, I think just a very simple answer to that without getting too many details, that the tool can handle EMPS-style questions. Um, different organizations handle the EMPS, uh, that's the Employee Net Promoter Score um, methodology slightly differently, so we can help and advise on that. Um, but yes, it's perfectly possible to put an EMPS-type metric into this platform. Um, we do see a number of organizations using those types of metrics. Um, so, you know, I think that, in, in that I don't know if I'll add to that, but then yeah. I think that's the basic kind of... Yeah, that's right. It's growing in popularity. Um, so, you know, we're borrowing on customer science. When we talk about employee experience, we're borrowing from customer science, and they've used that, the net promoter score for a long time. So um, even though our research team does wince when we talk about EMPS scores, actually it's built into the system, and, and many organizations are using it to track now. Um, so we've seen a big uptake in that, and the system does support it. Yeah. Okay, and one final question uh, before we move on to the to the next section. Um, if you want to differentiate between multiple generations in the workforce um, within the results, um, how how would you do that using what we've seen and, and how easy is it to, to differentiate between the different generations when we're looking at reporting and actions? So it's quite straightforward. Basically, within the, within the software, there is the functionality to break down by different demographics. So if we go into the reports, online interactive reporting, 
Um, on the side, you can see a category breakdown or question breakdown. And what these let you do is be able to segment the data by uh, the different demographics that you might have. So in this particular case, we can break down by gender, age, we can include um, generation as well, and you'll be able to see how the scores vary across the different questions by each of these different demographics. So if you were expecting um, a, a bit of a difference, you can see here that Females are significantly less positive than males on my teamwork group is able to meet our work challenges effectively. Um, and it just lets you be able to, to distinguish whether you need to focus your action planning in a slightly different way um, by segmenting the data. Okay. Thank you. I think that those are the those are the closest questions we have for specific stuff around building the platform. We have a few questions from people wanting to find out how much this kind of stuff costs and how it can be deployed, but I think those questions are possibly better taken uh, taken offline, uh, although we will give a kind of guide at the end in terms of some fantastic offers that uh, Willis Towers Watson have, have provided to people who've attended the webinar. Um, so if we can move on to the next section, um, this is this is a good time to do that. Sure, okay. Uh, we're also conscious of time, um, so up at the top of the hour now. Um, well, we'll touch on cost as well in a moment, um, but just wanted to share with you some new sort of technology, um, which has become very uh, increasingly um, sought after by our clients. I'm just trying to... Okay. Yeah. So what, what often, the question we often get asked by clients is, great, we've got this employee engagement data, you've highlighted that... Um, Right, we're slow or very we're slow to move from idea to action. Um, what can we do about it? And, and often surveys don't really give you those insights. Um, but we're talking about sort of connecting with millennials and how they want to interact with their company and decision makers. So we have a new software which essentially allows you to uh, have an online focus group of um, anything up to thousands of employees. We've used it up um, to, to, to that many people or down to as few as 100 people. Um, you can actually ask people to, to sign up for this during the employee engagement survey itself and say, I'll be interested in joining a group. Um, they're, they're typically moderated sessions um, and you would simply ask questions. Um, you collect some demographic questions first. You'd have some preloaded questions you want to discuss. Um, ask open-ended questions. And then what's very interesting about this software is as you begin to dig deeper into, you know, why are we so um, uh, inefficient, uh, people begin to type answers and then a picture builds build of what people are saying and you get a chance to vote on it. So this is the most popular idea that's come through so far. Um, it's around cross-functional teams. Do you believe this is the most effective way? So not only do you get these sort of the um, social jam chats, but you actually begin to get a consensus around the ideas that seem to be building, um, you know, the most interest in terms of the community. So at a session like this, this is sort of an example of uh, a moderator beginning to dig into an organization. Um, now uh, some, some ideas are coming through, you're beginning to, you can vote on these and everyone begins to vote on these, so that's how you build a consensus. And then you begin to dig a bit deeper. Um, uh, so what, what, is, what is it about reputation that matters to you the most? So it's, um, a very sort of a new way of engaging with audiences. Um, it takes the survey beyond data into act actual actions. Um, as, as I said, you can talk to thousands of people at the same time. It will typically take about 15 minutes, 20 minutes to complete one of these, and then you get the results back from us, which shows you, you know, what people voted on, what was the consensus, and where the differences by the big demographics. Um, so we're getting a huge interest in this, um, partly because it, it takes the survey to the next stage, but also because um, it really is a different way of connecting with people. Yeah, and I think certainly in an African context, we're seeing a lot of interest just because you can be in 17 different African countries and have a focus group that involves all those people or a subsection of them in each country. Uh, and as Matt said, the results are available in real time. So as a moderator, you don't have to do any writing up of data or results because it's all done for you within the platform. So I uh, just wanted to tease you with a little bit of a idea of some of the newer technology that sits around that kind of survey platform and where we started off the basic kind of construct of engagement, how it's been measured, active listening, employee experience, 
And these types of kind of um, very snazzy, very quick, very efficient ways of engaging lots of employees in ongoing conversations. Okay, Matt. Yeah. Okay, so that was all we were going to show in terms of the technology. Um, Alex, I don't know if you've got any sort of final wrap-up questions. Um, anything you want, think, want to... Yeah, yeah I, think, I think the questions that we're probably best dealing with are the ones around how, how do we get this? Um, because there's a few of those and, and uh, that seems to be a natural, natural stopping point. So how would we go about acquiring uh, this type of solution for our organizations? Well, basically, I think in the uh, side match, we'll put up some contact details for ourselves, so you can contact um, any of us, and we can come back to you. Uh, you mentioned costs earlier. Um, you know, this is a very cost-effective solution for organizations. So uh, the way it works is you buy an annual license fee for the platform. You can do as many or as few surveys as you like for that license fee. And license fees, uh, depending on organizational size, start at about 5,000 US dollars per year for the license fee for unlimited surveys. Um, just to give an idea of that kind of entry point into this, uh, into this platform and this process. Uh, for organizations that want to uh, move ahead with it, contact us. You know, we can write a, a very quick proposal. Um, and, you know, if you want additional things around that, of course, you know, we, we can talk about that. But, you know, uh, this is designed to be something that's largely self-service, although we do have a number of organizations that use the platform, but also ask us to, to give them a little bit of a, additional hand-holding, consultancy support, maybe doing executive presentations or on survey design in the first year before they take that over more themselves internally. Okay. Okay. So anything from $5,000 upwards, depending on uh, the size of the organization, and within that, it's kind of all you can eat. Uh, surveys. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, and there are a couple so, of... Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So, so it works on a very simple bolt-on uh, methodology. So there's a core platform cost and that allows you um, uh, support uh, during the process. So there's a help desk, um, but then you can bolt on any amount of support as you want. And there's a menu of services uh, with price uh, for each item. So that's all available. Great. Transparent and, and easy to understand. Um, there are a couple of offers as well, I think. Um, Related to the Talent Agenda series, these are exclusives. This is your 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 fantastic reward for joining this webinar. If the data wasn't enough of a reward already, um, we've a couple of offers in place. Um, the first one of them is so from within a month of today, if you're able to to commit to joining the platform and and finding out about the uh, the opportunities to engage your workforce better using the Pulse system. Um, for a month from today, we're, Willis Towers Watson are also offering access to their uh, project management portal um, alongside the, the software itself. Now, project management portal sounds a bit boring. It's not. It is, in fact, their entire repository of, of IP around consulting and best practices for these surveys. So this is the treasure trove of how to build employee engagement surveys written by the people that do it the most in Africa. Um, and, and access to this platform will be available um, alongside the survey, which isn't normally. It's normally a lot more expensive to get their, their, their time and, and an effort for this kind of stuff. But it's alongside the survey for the next month um, to anybody that's attended this webinar or anybody this webinar who refers it to a, a colleague in their organization. Uh, that's, that's, that's right, isn't it, guys? Yep, I guess yeah, that's fairly true. Um, as I said, you know, it's, it is that repository. So it's everything from if you need to send an introductory email um, to employees, here are four examples, it's examples of communication strategies, all the collateral um, information on designing surveys, how to project manage things, manage stakeholders in organizations. It's basically a, a how-to guide in an uh, online portal for every stage of delivering, uh, designing, and acting on surveys. Fantastic. Fantastic. Quite valuable and available free for the next month. Um, in addition to that, there's another offer that we're linking to the Talent Agenda Series uh, conferences uh, this year. The guys don't know about it yet, so I'm throwing them firmly under the bus. Um, and that is that when you attend a Talent Agenda Series conference in, in Lagos, Nairobi, or Johannesburg, um, all the team that's been on this webinar, so I'll come, but I don't know how much value I'll, had, I'll add. Uh, but the team will also sort of sit and help you to work through uh, the design of surveys or just, just bounce ideas about the best way to survey things. 
um, or the yep. best way to review reports. And, and that's normally uh, an additional cost. But if you're at a conference of hours over the year, uh, the, the team from Willis Towers Watson will be there too. And if you're using their platform, they will be delighted to, to give you some gratis consultancy to optimize what you're doing. Uh, absolutely, Alex, and we're happy to be thrown under the bus there because we'd be delighted to um, help whatever stage you are in terms of the cycle, whether it's questionnaire design or stakeholder management or, or the results themselves, happy to sit down with you and work through those. Because they're that nice, um, in addition to having all the answers, they're, they're very nice people. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Crispin, Matthew and, and Mirav, for, for a really enlightening presentation. I learned a lot. I've got to go away and uh, and work on some things in our organization off the back of this. I'm sure everybody else did as well. There were a number of questions that we didn't get to answer, um, but we will circulate those questions between the presenters and see if we can get answers back to everybody uh, offline. Um, and then it just sort of remains to say um, thank you once again, but also if you're interested in hearing more from Willis Terrace Watson and, and their portfolio of things that they do, um, the team will be joining us again in May for another Talent Agenda Series webinar um, this time focused on cyber risk, and they'll be joining us again later in the year um, to to tell us about total reward. So our team at GCC with the Talent Agenda Series will be in touch with all the, uh, all your attendees to to give you a heads up about when when and where and all those things. Well, where they're online, obviously that was stupid, but when they're going to happen. Um, so uh, you'll be able to sign up for those and, and hear more from Willis Towers Watson in due course. And the next time we'll be returning with the Talent Agenda Series webinar will actually be next month when we will be talking capacity development. Um, so thank you all very much for joining us today. Uh, please do come and register for the Lagos Conference if you're, if you're going to be in town in April. We're there on the 25th and 26th of April, and you can find out about that on talentagendaseries.com. Thank you all again. Thanks to Willis Towers Watson, and we hope you have a fantastic rest of the day. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.